That's enough of that. <laughs> Trying to work up a sweat there. <laughs> All right, this is somewhat. <coughs> oh man, let me catch my breath real quick. <laughs> this is somewhat uh, impromptu. Uh, whew, I gotta catch my breath. I'm way out of shape. So <coughs> I wasn't necessarily planning on going live this evening. Um, I've got three interviews uh, this week um, that I'm recording. <coughs> and I recorded one last week. So I'm going to be busy this week uh, recording interviews with uh, distillers and so forth this week from Texas. Uh, Jimmy Jazz, thank you much for tuning in. Chad Adams, thank you for tuning in. Uh, Arthur Lopez, thank you for tuning in. Anyway, so I have... Uh, uh, interviews I'm doing this week, and I bought a new camera. If you notice, we have a much wider view here than typically do when I go live. Let's see if I can get a good pop. There we go. Um, so I want to make sure everything was working. You know, I was using a new camera and so forth. So I plugged it in, and I did a test stream with the new camera. And it was really choppy. It was like, you know, when you move and it's like, I was like, oh, crud, you know. Uh, one thing you do, when you always want to test your your equipment. Um, you set in private mode, record in private mode. Test it that way to make sure everything's working and working right. Because there's nothing worse than going live and stuff not working or you know, you're you're taking up someone else's time to do an interview. So I was testing my equipment. And then Chad and Sarah, um, it's bourbon night. It's bourbon night. They were supposed to go live, but they posted that they're not they were not going live tonight because one or two of them are ill. Hope it's not serious. Hope to get well soon. So I thought, okay, what the heck? Let's go live. Um, hey, Alan, thank you much for tuning in. Uh, Matt, Whiskey Crusaders, thank you much for tuning in. Chad Adams, thank you much for tuning in. So I thought, what the heck, let's go live. I need to do an uncorking. And uh, this is sort of a topic that has been on my mind. You know, are Texas whiskeys too oaky? Oh, they're too much oak, too much extraction, too much tannin, blah, 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 right? But a topic on my mind and some people, uh, that's what they've heard. Uh, some people, they may have had one or two whiskeys from Texas, and that's what they think, and so forth. Uh, Nate Bird, thank you much for tuning in. Um, Kilcore says, I've had the same idea to go live, but I'm dead tired and have no idea what we would talk about. So, all right. So it's been on my mind, so what the heck? Let's check out the new video. Hey, let me know what you think. Uh, one of the things, so I use all Mac, and you're supposed to be able to download an app by which you can, hey, Mark Brown, the one last cause. Thank you much for tuning in. You're supposed to be able to make some adjustments, but <coughs> apparently they didn't set it up for Mac. It's just for PC. Hopefully they'll fix that later. Anyway, so I have three bourbons here, three representative bourbons. Um, this is one. I'm gonna, my my review for this one will post later this week. 
Uh, during a live stream, in fact, uh, Matt was in on it on Jason Mash and Drums channel. Uh, I came on the live stream. This is Friday night. I came on around, I don't know, around one o'clock my time. I don't know what time. It was probably like three o'clock in the morning, everybody else's time. Um, so I was getting in this a little bit then. Uh, the CEO, co founder of the distillery, uh, Chris Seals. I just did an interview with him. That will post as a premiere next Friday. And I will be um, doing an interview with one of the distillers there. Uh, to, I'll record it tomorrow night. It'll post later this week. And then uh, my review of this will post later this week as well. Um, all right. So I have in this corner, I have Garrison Brothers, uh, Texas Straight Bourbon Whiskey, 2000, the 2016. As you can see, I've got about halfway through there. This is bottled at 47% alcohol by volume. This is one that does have some distribution outside of Texas. Um, this is the first batch from uh, Still Austin. Uh, it's from grain to glass, 100% Texas, 100% Texas. Uh, it's bottled at 50.2% or 100.4 uh, proof. This is another bourbon. We're doing bourbons tonight. And hopefully, it's bourbon night. We'll get better. They will get over this cold sickness, whatever it is they got. I hope it's not serious. So I'm doing bourbons uh, in their honor and hope they get well soon. This is a Ben Milam barrel proof straight bourbon whiskey bottled at 113.2 proof or 56.6 ABV. 56.6 ABV. This is batch 19-04. Now, um, Ben Milam Distilleries is going through a transition because Heather Green, who is a whiskey sommelier, she's written a book, and she's like, probably like the first person ever publicly referred to as a whiskey sommelier. She moved from New York into Texas, Austin, Texas, uh, to join the team. And so they're transitioning, changing the name. To, it's going to be Milam Green rather than Ben Milam. Um, and I've been dialoguing back and forth with her. I'm hoping to have uh, her, her on the channel as well. Yeah, Alan, I saw your review there. Uh, Garrison Brothers, uh, he had the Balmaria, uh, awesome stuff. Uh, Alan, uh, the whiskey friend. If you guys aren't familiar with Alan, the whiskey friend, uh, he's over in Manchester, England, if I recall, and he's from uh, originally from Glasgow. Uh, Scotland. Uh, so if I'm familiar with them, uh, check them out. Kind of surprises up this uh, late at night. Um, uh, Mark Brown said, open a spot was a switchblade now. Well, of course. I mean, what do you, didn't everybody, didn't everybody open bottles with switchblade? I mean, isn't that the norm? You know, you're supposed to get ready for a knife fight. Uh-oh, got a super chat. Oh, crap. Got to do it again. How it everybody's head about the bed. I'm going to pass out if I keep doing it. <sighs> All right. Arthur, there we go. English says, hell yeah, Texas whiskeys. I bottled down my uh, first bottle of Balcona's Wintas, Juntas, how you pronounce it, a tequila cast finished single malt. And that was matured exclusively in French oak prior to its finishing. So thank you very much for the $10. All right. Bird is the word. If you guys didn't see the opening, I was doing a lot more dancing to that tune. Bird is a word. <laughs> All right. So in doing an order in terms of if you're going to do a flight, hey, Bayou Dram, thank you much for tuning in. It looks like I got here just in time to see Eric have a seizure. <laughs> I used to open up, I used to open and finish my live streams with dancing all the time. And, and I first did it as a joke, and then it kind of became my thing, and then I kind of got burned out on it, so I kind of quit doing it. But anyway, so in doing a flight, you could go ABVs, you know, start low and go higher. You could take into consideration, you know, the intensity of it, regardless of the ABV. Of course, if you're talking scotch, you would do probably non-peated, then peated, whatever else. This, this is 50.2 ABV. This is 47 ABV. And yet, in terms of flavor, 
and style of bourbon, because these are all bourbons, uh, the still whiskey is actually lighter and more delicate in flavor than the Garrison Brothers. I probably put too much in my glass of the Ben Milam. I don't want to get tanked here. Let's put a little bit, just a little bit of the Garrison Brothers. I haven't had this in a while. Uh, so I visited Garrison Brothers in April 2019. And then I had Dan Garrison on my channel. So if you haven't seen those videos, you can check those out. And I'm going to, at the end of this Texas marathon, I'm going to do a, my top five out of all Texas whiskeys. Um, and then I'll probably do like my favorite single malt and my favorite bourbon. But that'll be at the end of all this. But in terms of intensity of flavor between these three, it's not just a matter of ABV. Um, it's stylistically, you know, are the it, uh, uh, um, stylistically, you know, how long did they age it, right? Did they do them just a year, two years, four years? So you could have something that's more intensely flavored because it spent more time on the oak. How did they do their aging process? Um, Still Austin does uh, what's called, um, my brain just went blank for a second. Hold on. Another French word wants to uh, jump into my brain. The, the word for the gap between the, 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 the spirit and the top of the barrel is oulage. The élevage. Élevage in whiskey has to do with, you start at cash strength and you start proofing down during the aging process. And I'll get we'll get more into that in my interview with Chris Seals. Elevage in winemaking has to do with uh, going from um, the fermentation tanks all the way to the bottle. It has to do with that whole process. Same word, both mean to be lifted up or move on, um, but a different context and uh, how the word is being used. So higher ABV, but climate and everything else makes the Garrison Brothers more intense. So whether something is more intense in flavor or not, isn't just a matter of ABV. And then I haven't even tasted this one yet. And this is cash strength. So this is the highest cash strength. This is the high, this is 56.6, 47, uh, and let's call it 50 point, and 50, 50 point two. So this is the biggest ABV, um, but let's, anyway, let's go. So. I'll give you a more formal review. I don't want to get these mixed up. That's the Ben Milam. Let's get the knife out of the way. This. So uh, I'm going to change the order of the bottles just so that representative of the glasses. So don't get confused here so I can keep these straight. All righty. So if we look at color... I don't know how well you guys can see that. It might not look that much different uh, for you guys, but the one in my right hand, the uh, Garrison Brothers, is actually slightly darker. And then the Ben Milam is even darker than that. But I don't know how well that's pick being picked up on the camera. <clears throat> Hey, Robert Liquors, thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Speaking of bourbons, I could take out another bourbon and do one of theirs, but I, I got three here on the hand. So, are Texas whiskeys overly oaked? So, if you ask anyone in the wine world, do you like California Chardonnays? Do you like California Chardonnays? What you're going to hear, I'm going to take a little sip real quick. Hmm. What you're going to hear from a lot of people is, oh, I don't like California Chardonnays. They're overly oaky, and they use too much malolactic fermentation, which actually isn't a fermentation. It's a conversion. Malolactic fermentation or conversion is a conversion of um, malic acid, which is a crisp as acid that you'd have in a green apple, over to lactic acid, which is acid you'd have in milk. So when you have that creamy, buttery character, that's from uh, the malolactic con conversion, the acid con conversion. 
And then they say too much vanilla, too much oak, too much all that. You really can't get, get to the grapes. They might say the same thing about Cabernet Sauvignon. Oh, too much oak, a lot of vanilla. You know, it's just as intense. And it cassis, these big oak bombs. But that's sort of a stereotype of California Chardonnays. Now, why did that? And, and Cabernets. Now, why is that? Because somebody, the rookie wine and whiskey enthusiast, thank you very much for tuning in. I can't recall if I've seen you here before. Everyone in Washington State think California Chardonnays are overly, way overly oaked. Right. Now, have you seen the movie Sideways, um, uh, which takes place in Don Burgundy? There's a comment in there by Miles. He says, um, he makes a comment about you know too much secondary malolactic fermentation. There's no such thing as secondary malolactic fermentation. Malolactic fermentation is secondary. You to say secondary malolactic fermentation is redundancy. And two, it's not really a fermentation. It's a conversion, but whatever. Anyway, so he's, he makes that comment. So that's sort of the stereotype of California Chardonnays. And what I would love to do with people who think that way is get a Chardonnay from um, Stony Hill. Stony Hill is uh, in... Um, on, on Spring Mountain above St. Helena in the in the Napa Valley. And Steve A, thank you much for tuning in up in, in the Napa Valley. And their Chardonnays, to really get the best out of them, you need to age them in the bottle for over 10 years. That's another stereotype is that these, I know you're talking talk about wine. Why are you talking about wine? You're talking about whiskeys. Because I'm talking about stereotypes and we're going to get there. Um. Those are wines that you can sit on for 20 years, 20 years. If you were to do that with Rombauer, Rombauer is sort of the stereotypical overly oaky, buttery Chardonnay. Most, a lot of people who don't like that style, Captain, make it happen. Thank you much for tuning in. Um, they don't like that because it's too buttery, too oaky. It's like, it's like eating buttery popcorn. Now, personally, sometimes I like those kind of Chardonnays. I like them with... Take another sip. Hmm. I like this. Um, I like those buttery oaky chardonnays with chicken pot pie. We have the creamy sauce. You got the crust of, of the pot pie. It works really well. It's good. Good. good goes well with popcorn. But if you take Stony Hill and you 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 have someone taste Stony Hill Chardonnay, and they would think it's from Burgundy. Um, they would even after you've owned uh, uh, agent for more than 10 years. Richard Amiro, thank you much for uh, tuning in and I look forward to uh, chatting with you later on this week. Ready. So, what can happen is a region, whether they're talking about wines or whiskeys, can have a reputation because that's what really sort of stands out about the style of whiskeys that they make. And then, consequently, that's what everybody thinks of. When they think, when you think, for example, here's a perfect example taste of scotch. When you think Isla, right? Think Isla. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Just say it in the chat. What's the first thing that comes into mind when you think of Isla single malt scotch? Just put it in the chat. While I take another sip, I'll take one from Garrison Brothers. What do you think of, when, you, when most people think of Isla, what do they think of? Whoa. Nobody said anything yet because you're all chatting amongst yourselves. Still waiting for an answer. Do, 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 Y'all still awake? Do, 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 do. Pete, there you go. Uh, Pete, Pete, that's right. Ardbeg, Pete, smoke, smoke. Pete, there's some other things that could be in there. Pete, everybody says Pete. Mm. You think of oceanic, you think of medicinal, you think of um, briny characteristics, right? So why is that? Well, because of I'm, the scenic views, yes. This, I, I love Isla. If the weather's nice, on a sunny day, a nice sunny day on Isla, uh, from the southern distilleries, you can actually look out there. You can see it in the distance. You can actually see Ireland. So, what it really makes what really makes Isla so different than the Highlands and Spaceside and the Lowlands 
are, are those heavily peated, briny, oceanic whiskeys that are so characteristic of it, right? Now, there are a lot of, well, not a lot, but there are non-peated or lightly peated whiskeys on Isla um, that if you're tasted blind, you might not necessarily know that they are uh, um, from Isla, right? Um, Kalila actually, once in a while, does an unpeated whiskey. Um, Brucladi is an uh, uh, unpeated whiskey. Uh, the Bunahaven 12 is just just like 3% PPMs. Some people say it's unpeated, but it is just a wee bit. But also, of course, in the Highlands, uh, one of the things that surprised me when I was up there, I'm taking another sip. This is Garrison Brothers. We're coming in late, doing a little bit of a comparison, three different bourbons. Uh, from um, Texas. This is the Still Lost in Texas at 50.2 ABV. This is the Garrison Brothers. Uh, this is one that gets more distribution, the 2016, 47% ABV. And I just did an uncorking of the Ben Milam, and their distillery is actually transitioned into Milam Green. When I was there, they had bottled their first release of Milam Green, but it wasn't for sale yet. So I couldn't buy one. I tasted it, but I couldn't buy one supposedly someone's supposed to get me a bottle, but we'll see how it goes. Now, just comparing, just comparing Still Austin with Garrison Brothers, this isn't even aged two years. Uh, I'll give a more formal review later. But it has none of the, sh you know, I mentioned some other whiskeys, particularly California whiskeys. If they're really, really young, it's like someone took a wood planer and went, and you're getting that peel of wood coming off the wood planer, you with a hand planer. And sometimes you get those green notes. Maybe some people like that, but I kind of don't like that. The amazing thing about this whiskey is, it doesn't have the green notes and it doesn't have that wood shaving note that you would think. Uh, uh, Matt says, I do hope to be able to Milam, go to Milam Group soon enough as, as well because it, it is great. Uh, absolutely. So this is the, I, I'm sort of giving away my review already. This fifth, over 50 ABV, me, moderate intensity and in flavor. It's not light, it's not heavy, moderate intensity and in flavor. I feel like I can actually taste the distinctiveness of each element. I can take the distinctiveness of the grain, of the fermentation process, of uh, the oak, and yet it's not an oak bomb. It doesn't have the newness, that new shaved oak character to it. Um, the, the spices, it has a good rye component into it. So in the mid to the back, there is this nice... A little bit of pepper and um, a slight licorice note to it. So it has a nice rye character to it. And I think even in a younger bourbon, if you have a maybe kick up the rye content, that rye content may help. Robert would probably know better than I would. Uh, I'm sure he would. Um, if you have a higher rye content, that might help mask the youth, perhaps, possibly, uh, potentially. It's a way to deal with younger whiskey. So on the back, it says at least age, at least one year. Now, and in the interview, um, the CEO, Chris Seals, he says that they're going to have a, a, a straight bourbon soon to be released, which is minimally two years. So they do have a straight, which will be their flagship, which is coming out in the near future. Now, um, Garrison Brothers, I don't know how long this was aged. I know in an interview he mentioned it. So let's see. It was harvested in 2000, the corn harvest in 2011, distilled in 2012, release date 2016. So four years and under, four years and under. This has that sort of darker, intense caramel corn canned corn, barbecued corn. Actually, if you put a corn on a grill, it's kind of like that. It's got that intense vanilla 
and it also has a distinctive caramelized wood note on the back end. And for those, so for some people who maybe don't like that, I don't get any greenness off or anything like that. But for some people who they've had, perhaps they've had a cash strength of Garrison Brothers, that's what's in their head. Maybe if somebody has had perhaps Balconas and they have, which, you know, cash strength of Balconas and they didn't bother to put some water into it, perhaps they get that perception as well. Um, Hey, Welsh Turtle, thank you much for tuning us in. I've already had Balconas, uh, so I can't say. Balconas had a lot of oak and tastes young, but I like them. Okay, cool. The main point I'm trying to get across here is um, there are multiple different factors which lend itself to its profile, but also the aging process. They use the Elevage process uh, like... Um, Iron Rouge, Repu Iron Rouge, uh, Iron Rouge, Iron Root Republic, and they have the same cons consultant Nancy Fraley, who um, who has a Armagnac background as well as uh, Robert. So they're using that, that a different aging process as well as getting their water to a uh, bottle strength, and so that plays a different role. If someone didn't like this style. Of bourbon, I could see they would think, okay, you think of the climate, you think of the weather, you think everything else. I tasted this, therefore, that is Texas. And that's a real dangerous approach to approaching either whiskeys or wines. Mm. I am Groot Republic. I am Groot. <laughs> Richard, I'm going to steal that one. Um, you could develop, and if you, so I don't know how many distillers, I've been to like 12, 13. I don't know what the total is, because not all of them are part of, of the trail, and I haven't been to all the ones on the trail. But if you had just a few California Chardonnays, and those California Chardonnays were leaning into a profile that a lot of people like, then you might get a stereotype of that type of Chardonnay. Same thing for a Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa. Particularly if you're getting your wines from a grocery store, which aren't really meant to be aged, you go you there, you grab them, pick it home. And those ones tend to have a little bit more residual sugar as well. Versus ones of the higher end ones, the, the more age worthy ones and so forth. Um, you might also sort of stereotype Highlands and Space Side, you think of McAllen, Abelar, Glendronic, um, you, I mean, Glen Morey, um, Glen Grant, Glen Fittick, Glen, uh, Glen Farkless, and taste those and what's available. And you go, okay, this is what the Highlands and Space Side are all about and generalities. Take another sip. And therefore conclude that all space side or all highlands are like this. And yet one of the things I learned when I went up there is a lot of those distilleries produce one bottling of a peated whiskey that may not get wide distribution. And so that whiskey, even Glendronic does one apparently. And so doesn't fit into the stereotypical profile. Excuse me, I'm burping here doesn't fit into the stereotypical profile of a Highlander space side. All right. Now I'm going to go into the uh, Milam, uh, Ben Milam. So I tasted this at the distillery um, and really, really liked it. Whoa. The other issue with, as I'm going, working my way into this, I just poured this, so I've been letting this breathe. Whether something is too oaky or has too much malolactic fermentation or too much rye or too much smoke or too much peat, whether it's too much or not, is a matter of personal, is a matter of personal taste. Now, we talk about balance, what constitutes balance. I tend to rate whiskeys in terms of development. 
Do they have a change from the, uh-oh, Mark Brown, just give me $5. All right. Well, gonna have a heart attack here shortly. <laughs> Can't do that too much. Otherwise, I start breaking out a sweat. I want to pass out here. But thank you much for the five bucks. <laughs> no, I, no, I completely lost my train of thought. Um, what was I saying? I don't remember. <laughs> anyway, so. Let's take another sip. Hmm. Now, on first sip, this, I could see, might a little bit fit into the stereotype of Texas. Not completely, but a little bit in terms of that intense oak character. Different than the uh, Garrison Brothers, and yet you can kind of see climate-wise some um, correlation uh, between them. Even if one's in Austin and the other one's in, I think it's called High Texas, Hay Texas, a different part of Texas, but still, you get, you get the point. Now, so the question is, can we then, is it is it then completely illegitimate to speak in generalities about a type of whiskey so that, hey, you can't talk about any distinction or difference between Speyside and Isla or between the lowlands and the highlands or between Texas and Kentucky or California. No, life has plenty of generalities and then exceptions to the rule. Welcome to planet Earth. Welcome to planet Earth. Robert Licorice, what is the blend of the Kentucky, Tennessee, and Texas whiskeys in that barrel proof release? Uh, you're talking about the uh, Ben Milam? Uh, what is the blend? I don't, I don't know. I haven't done any research on it. I'll have to look this up later. Uh, doesn't send, hold on. Blah, 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 It doesn't say. Uh, it doesn't say, so I don't know. Good question. Good question. All right. So life is full of generalities and then exceptions to the rule. This is planet Earth. There are somewhere between, we don't know the exact number because they haven't all been cataloged, somewhere between 1,500 and 3,000 different grape varietals. Somewhere about 1,500 in Italy alone. If you watch that movie, I mentioned it earlier, if you watch Sideways, um, near the beginning, early in the movie, he makes this comment about red grapes getting their color from the skins. Out of the, let's say there's 3,000 different grape varietals, whatever it is. Of the 3,000 grape varietals, that is true for 2,880 of them. That is true. The majority of them. But there is a grape variety. There are a class of grapes. They're called Tenchier grapes. Is Spencer in the house? I didn't see his name come up. Uh, oh, hey, Spencer. Hey, thank you much for tuning in. Um, there are these grapes called Tenchier grapes, T. E N T I E R, if I recall correctly, is spelled. And those grapes, red grapes, have red juice. So, you know, somewhere around 9,000, uh, excuse me, 2,800 and uh, 980 some odd grapes have clear juice, even though they're red grapes and they get their color from the skins. But there's like 12 or 13 or so 
that actually have red juice. One of them is Alicante Boucher, Alicante Boucher, uh, which is often used for adding color to other wines. They, 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 they'll, they'll put it into another wine to add some color to it. So in general speaking, red wines get their color from the skins, not from the juice, but they're exceptions. Same thing goes for Isla. Generally speaking, what you know about uh, Isla whiskeys is peat and ocean and, and um, medicinal notes and you know and all that. <coughs> but there are some that are not. When you think about climate and generalities of climate, its impact on whiskeys. Generally speaking, many. Texas whiskeys have this character of an intensity from the climate of the time spent interacting with the oak, right? Scotland, they, Scotland, their barrel entry level, oops, I'm going to talk it over. They put the spirit into the barrel, almost all of them, at 63.5% alcohol by volume. Some might be 62 but generally speaking, 63.5 is in the barrel all the time. Scotland has a cooler climate. If, overall, a lot of rain. If they didn't go that high a level of ABV, it would take them forever to get an extraction out of the casks. Right? Texas, however, they're completely different. They're mitigating the intensity of heat in various different ways. Some using this elevage method, some um, blending, some using lower ABV entry points. Uh, Andalusia, for example, uh, if you didn't see my interview with um, uh, Ty Phelps, Ty Phelps, Andalusia, they use a lower entry level for their single malts uh, in terms of ABV level because if they went in, you know, at Scotland levels, they would might get too much oak. Another thing they can do, you can't do it with bourbons, but you can do it with single malts, is don't use new oak. Is don't use new oak. And Balcones does that as well. But Balcones, sometimes they use uh, second or third use oak. So, so you don't get that over extraction. So you so there's a way of pulling in the reins or turning down the, the, the knobs in various different ways in the approach to doing whiskeys. Let's get back to the Ben Milam. Mm. It's on the back end. It's on the back end on this one that I'm, I'm getting that little intensity of, of, of barrel. I got on the Ranger Creek as well. Spencer Wyland says, Okay, y'all, kids are going to bed. Have a great night. Thanks, Eric, for your studies of Texas whiskeys. Spencer, thank you very much. If you guys don't know who Spencer is, Spencer is the head of the uh, Texas Whiskey Trail. Um, I, I don't know if he's the CEO of, of the Texas Whiskey Association or a member of the Texas Whiskey Association. Both in my uh, Texas Whiskey Month and then this marathon, I had him on um, to give us updates on what's going on in the Texas whiskey uh, industry. Um, if you, got, you just want to know more about um, Texas whiskeys in my other Texas whiskey videos in the description box down below. I'll put links to the Texas whiskey trail and the association. So you'll definitely check that out. Um, ben Demon Hunter talking about Texas found a bottle of the 1835 spirits, Louisville, Te Louisville, Texas. Bourbon, come and take it. So, that being said, uh, and Matt, the other night we were on, um, the mash and drum late night. I, I was I was in Napa on Friday. Went to a Bordeaux uh, tasting event, the annual Bordeaux tasting event uh, with the Institute of Masters of Wine. And we, this was in Napa. We went to there was like sixty two different uh, chateaus there. And then drove all the way home. I get back here I don't know midnight or whatever it was. Um, went online and sure enough, uh, mash and drum was live. Swami was on. Matt was on. Um, Rod Gut Review was on. Um, hey, Benjamin Eves, thank you so much for tuning on. So, what the heck? I jump, I end up jumping on, I end up being up till about one o'clock in the morning or so. Um, and why did I bring that up? Oh, because this 
this topic actually came up during that live stream uh, when which we were talking about whiskeys and uh, two members of the discussion <coughs> were sort of making these, I would say, overly generalized statements about whiskeys. And I was kind of like, eh, you know, um, there are some things that fit in that, but not. Uh, Robert Lich says, uh, night, thanks for the live tonight. Robert, thank you much for tuning in. Uh, we need to schedule for you to come on live to talk about the Magic Manicorn uh, whiskey in the near near future. And it was a really great, it was a great live stream. A um, lot of, you know, jocularity going on. And we talked about a lot of different things. We talked about uh, Wisconsin whiskeys, and we're sort of all over the map in our discussions. So, so to answer the question, are Texas whiskeys too oaky? One, one, what's your definition of too oaky? Is that a matter of personal preference? Number two, are there some that are going to be, yes, very oak forward? They intentionally lean in on that character to show themselves as, as having a distinctive style of whiskey that you could probably only get in Texas. Yes, some do that. But as still Austin, I think, is showing, not all of them are going to be like that. And they are doing taking various steps they're going to be different than Kentucky production, uh, bourbon production, um, or Scotland single malt in order to sort of counterbalance that intensity of oak. It's a matter of choice and how they're going to come up with their various uh, flavors. So uh, does anybody have any questions? If you have a question, um, put it on there. Uh, Matt, if you were set up, let me know. I'd be happy to bring you on. I'll send you a link to Matt Whiskey Crusaders. Um, just let me know if you want, just say yes or no. You might not set up, maybe not feel like it, whatever else, but I'm happy to bring you on. Probably only stick around for about another 15 minutes or so. Uh, that would keep this uh, at, at about, an, about an hour. So I like all of these bourbons. These are all very distinct bourbons. I'll put the, I'll do this. Mm -hmm. There we go. So Matt, if you want to come on, I'll put a link in here real quick. Um, I like them all. I could see there are going to be times in which I don't want that big oak. Uh, okay, cool. So Matt's going to come on in just a little bit. Give him a minute to get set up. There's going to be times in which, you know what? I'm in the mood for something big. I, it's same with wines. Uh, Sometimes I'm in a mood for sort of a big in-your-face Cabernet. <coughs> Earthquake. Uh, so Michael David is the winery. Michael David is the winery. And then they have an Earthquake line of Zinfandel, Petit Syrah, and Cabernet Sauvignon. And they're in Lodi. Michael David, Earthquake, Cabernet Sauvignon. And when I think Lodi, I typically don't go for Cabernet Sauvignon out there. Sometimes you're in the mood for like a chocolate cake that's a thick chocolate frosting, and it's just intensely dark chocolate cake, right? That sort of hedonistic, um, intense chocolateness, you know, maybe with chocolate chips in it. You know, sometimes you're in that mood. When I'm in that mood for a heavy duty cassis, black currants, blackberries, vanilla. I, and I want to go just pedal to the metal on that. I pick up uh, Ma uh, Michael David's Earthquake Cabernet Sauvignon around 20 bucks. And that's what I go for. Arthur Lopez says, price wise, which te Texas whiskey that you've had had the most bang for its buck when it came to flavor versus cost? That's an excellent question. The problem is, <coughs> I haven't paid. A super close attention to the price. However, however, Garrison Brothers, generally speaking, does lean itself on being more expensive. Andalusia and Balcones, particularly at these cast strengths and these higher ABVs, I think you get much more bang for your buck because, particularly with Balcones and the single malts, 
like I have the Hechiceros, Hechiceros and the Braharia. You can, that's almost like two bottles. Hey, there we go. Um, I'm going to bring on Matt here. There you go. Hey, how's it going? So I'm just answering the question. So Balcona's, their whiskey, is, it's almost like you're getting two bottles of whiskey in one bottle. Because there's so much intensity, high ABV, they don't expect you, although they don't forbid you, from drinking it at that intensity. But there's a lot of room to play around with it and really stretch out the glass. And I found, uh, particularly these two, um, definitely I add some water or throw in an ice cube and let the ice cube you know, melt to get them to the balance. That makes them not only, you know, they might be $80, $120. Not only does that make a value play in terms of just the base prices of value play, but the fact that you can stretch them so long by adding your own water or an ice cube makes them even, even greater value play. And so uh, Balcones, again, there's more distilleries. I have to try more distilleries. For me personally, I, that seems to be one of the highest uh, quality price ratios. Um, what do you think, Matt? Yeah, I agree. Balcones by far, especially the vast breadth of different uh types of whiskey they make is amazing and all the different finishes they do them and iron root are probably by, by far my two favorites plus they make a bunch of different types so yeah for your value those two are by far the best and if you didn't agree to me i'd just remove you from the live stream that's fine too yeah, <laughs> whatever works no i, I agree about kind of is, is like it's probably my favorite with lion root by far um about kind of is what made me fall in love with Texas whiskey. And then I met Robert and Jonathan and really started liking Iron Root as well once I'd met them and tried their stuff. So, but yeah, I, I love both of those a lot. But quality price ratio in terms of what you're getting out of the out of the box. Oh, yeah. I mean, really and truly, because I mean, they, they range anywhere from, um, let's see, on Iron Root between 35 to 50. And on Balcona is anywhere from about 30 to 80. But yeah, price ratio, you can't really go wrong with any of all the stuff that's 80 is all store picks, distillery onlys, and they're all freaking amazing. I've never had one that's not a mind blowing good. And and I hate to bring this up, but I've been I was looking at Scott's whiskeys. I just by the way, I just ordered a bottle of the Ardbeg Galileo. Oh wow. I got it for half the price that really? they found it at uh, the whiskey exchange. So I'm super happy about that. That's Even awesome. With even with the added tax and the tariff, I'm still getting it for half the price. Yeah. That's a hard to find bottle. I, um, I had kitties. I had kiddos. Girls, hush, we're live. Stop would not, screaming. This would not be a live stream with Matt without kids screaming in the background. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, I'm really happy about that. But I was checking other bottles. Um, I was looking at the McAllen Classic Cut. For 2019, the uh, McAllen Classic Cut is usually like around. I, I don't know if Matt, if you can still hear me or not. Um, but the McAllen Classic Cut is usually like 57% ABV, 57.1, something like that. Um, so it's the closest thing you're going to get to a cash strength whiskey from McAllen. That's widely distributed. And I was checking checking the 2000. I have. I, I have the 2017. I have tasted 2018 McAllen Classic Cut. The 2019 is now out, mm. um, and it's like it's like forty dollars more than previous releases. Jeez, yeah, yeah. That 17. That 17 was significantly better than the 18 too. Yeah, um, shame to hear. So that adds to the value of a quality American single malt. Such as Andalusia, love and and love and Andalusia and Balcones. Now, in a blind taste test, um, in a blind taste test, would you confuse Balcones with a Scotch? I don't know. I'd have to test uh, that. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, supposedly it's been done. I know there was a big thing they won where they got confused with Scotch, so it's certainly possible. I don't know. Go look. Hold on, I gotta go help her find a remote. There you go. That's what dads are for. <laughs> anyway, so, um, and the two that would come to my mind is uh, the Andalusia Striker. No, 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 no. The Andalusia, yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, hold on. The, the, sure, the, the Br um, Balcones Brujeria. Side by side with a cast strength, uh, Glendronic cast strength. I have a hand filled bottle, I give it 100 points that I brought back 
from Glendronic. In terms of the intensity and quality of the whiskeys, if you're going to confuse, if you're going to confuse uh, Falcona's Brujeria with a Scotch, I would say it would probably be a cast strength, um, base side, heavily sherried cask. If I was going to confuse it with a Scotch, yeah, that would make sense logically. Yeah, that one's pretty intense. But I could see it confuse it with scotch, though, for sure. I mean, right. that's what it's supposed to be for. Right, 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 right. The one thing is, is if you're super paying attention, I would say morally, if you add, if you take both cash strength, the scotch, and the Texas single malt, and you add a little bit of water to it, you know, to bring the ABV down, um, they would become even much more like, because I think you would be reining in a little bit, mm -hmm. that little bit of oak character on, off the balconas, Agreed. That would never be there. And so you'd be back and it'd become even more scotch like, which is the way they sort of want you to taste it anyway, you know, and figure yeah. out where you want it to be anyway. Exactly. All right. Yeah, I had to hide my bottles of cast strength balconas for myself because I kept drinking them. Seriously, I stuck them away behind many boxes. <laughs> I finally okay. got it out again the other day. I was like, oh, I found this again. I remember how great this is. Hey, can you come over and help me find my remote? Yeah, for real. <laughs> Yeah, of course, it's in there underneath a bag of beef jerky. I'm like, thanks, kid. I just lift this bag of beef jerky up. It's, it's ridiculous. It's always something. It's like they're quiet. As soon as you go live, no, that's when we got to make tons of noise. It never fails. So as soon as you go live, okay, the guys with the Harley Davidsons are driving by. Exactly. Uh, or the internet comes out or something like that. Oh, yeah. You know, it's, what, it's typical something like that happens. Let's see. That's broke. But, broke. Uh, yeah, the French oak. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Jason's got a bottle of that. I would really like to. I don't have that. I'd like to get a bottle of that as well. Oh, the French oak. Yeah. So um, is that a is that a larger production or was that like a super limited release? This year, you can actually get it outside of the distiller. Before mm -hmm. it was only distiller, but this year they did produce some out into the stores. Um, I can ask yeah. around and see if somebody can still get one for you. Yeah, it's well, freaking I phenomenal. There's, I mean, there's, and there's more distilleries down there that I want to visit. Uh, go down to the Southern Coast, with the Houston area, and yeah. all that. I would like to uh, visit. I, I keep wanting to call it Hat Backwards. Um, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, at Ta Wakara. Yeah, I would like to. I would like to visit them, and that's in your neighborhood, right? Yeah, that's like 25 minutes from my house. Yeah. So I mean, come visit you. You know, sleep at your house. Drink oh yeah, that'd be awesome. Make a visit the distillery. So or something else, right? It's, it's a cool little place. They're awesome guys, and it's good whiskey. Hey, Richard, thank you very much for tuning in, and I look forward to uh, talking to you uh, later on this week. So, um, what what did you just or you just poured yourself some? Yeah, throat? this is the now this is the Texas single malt. This is a, as a barrel pick. It's a cast strength at sixty three point three percent. The Froak is at sixty one point nine. Yeah, I'll compare. I'll, just, I'll pour both so we can compare. Only 61.9. Only, yes. <laughs> yeah, how, the, the, the rum comes in at like 68.5, something like that. Holy cow. Wow. Yeah, the rum's the one I, I coughed on one time and burned the roof of my mouth. I had to go to the doctor for it. That was not fun. Benjamin like says, I swear, there's a switch in my chair that as soon as I sit, it triggers one of the kids to call for me. Oh, of course. Dad! I freaking sat down. <laughs> it's like when you sit first sit down, next thing you know, the you know, the telemarketers are calling and all that yeah. crap, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, geez, geez. It never fails. Ever. Yeah. Thank, thankfully you can put your phone on silent when you're trying to eat or whatever. Thank God. Yeah, there's no mute button for children. Be great, but it doesn't exist. So Benjamin, I don't know how you put J U N T O S. Juntos, Juntos. Oh, the Juntos, yeah. Juntos. Uh, no, I haven't. I've never even heard of that, that one. Um, at the Bastards Ball, it was that special bottle. It's this one that they had on the table. They kind of pulled it out towards the end. They're like, "Hey, we have this special one. It's not for release yet. You want to try it?" Oh, is is is, is I whiskey? She wines on right now. Yeah, they're on right now too. When, when did they start? Eight o'clock, which is what six o'clock for you. Okay, so twenty four minutes ago. All right, so. I know you just jumped in here, but I don't know if I keep going live or no, whatever you want to do. Whatever. So I mean, I, I tend to stick stick around for for an hour. 
Mm. Um, so if you guys haven't uh, checked out Whiskey Crusaders, you definitely want to check them out. Thanks. Uh, subscribe, check out their channel. Uh, they're in Texas, but they don't do just Texas. Uh, Matt one of, is one of the most generous um, people in the in the uh, whiskey tuber community, um, and your partners are Will and Sarah. Um, I think Will might have been on here in the chat earlier today. I'm not sure. He certainly could have been, right? And so, and if you're ever in Texas but you don't have time to visit the distillery, I tell people go to a whiskey shop. The the Hechiceros mm -hmm. and the Brahari, I didn't get it at the distillery. I bought it actually at uh, mm -hmm. Total Wine and More. Um, so you can always. Get, get them there. And so if you're just going through the airport, I don't know if, if they're set up in the uh, duty-free or in the, being sold in the airports or not. I wouldn't be surprised, but I don't actually know the answer to that question. I'll have yeah. to ask the Balcones reps if they are, and I just don't know. But if you got a layover in Dallas, you know, you got a yeah. couple of hours, uh, you know, run out, get an Uber or something, go go to a liquor store real quick. I'm sure there's plenty in the area. Oh, yeah, there's plenty. Grab a couple of bottles. Oh, yeah, there, there's Will. He's here. Well, hey, Will. Cheers. But yeah, it's good stuff. I mean, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, if you can go to a liquor store while you have a layover, I mean, you get lots of good Texas whiskey you can get while you're there. Or hopefully, if you go to one that has a tasting section, it'll let you find out real quick which ones you want to buy before you have to jump back on a plane. So, uh, what I got to hear, you guys got anything coming up that everybody should uh, know about on your channel? Actually, we shot one that came out today. It's our best video in a long that in probably ever as far as fast of re reviews. Um, was how to pick a great liquor store that came out today at one o'clock. Okay, I'll it's, check that out. Yeah, and then I guess later this week we're releasing uh, Crown Black and then Eagle Rare Seventeenth in the BTAC series. Okay, okay. So, and then tomorrow night we'll have our usual live, and I don't know the what this topic is going to be yet because it was going to be Teeling Whiskey with their uh, ambassador, but he had to cancel on us unfortunately last minute. Okay. So we've got to scramble and find a new topic for tomorrow. Okay. So this week, my review of the Still Austin will be out. New uh, an, an interview with the CEO, Chris Seals. And we go uber geeky, nerdy. All right. We, we really go into it. Um, and I actually have an interview. tomorrow. I'll record it tomorrow night, and it'll play later on um, with one of the uh, distillers. His name just slipped my mind. Um, Josh. Last time he was with an M. Madre. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's yeah, always yeah. awesome, dude. Yeah, so I'll have I'll actually recording it tomorrow night, but then it'll play uh, later on uh, in the review. So it'll be a really, really good week for that. And I'm actually going to be interviewing Richard Amiro. Oh, very cool. Um, uh, yeah, I want to get some people from behind the scenes, not just the people everybody knows. And next Thursday, I'm interviewing the Emma Nehemiah. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, oh, yeah. Really I'm really looking that. forward to that. So oh, I'm Emma's interviewing great. her. I love Emma. She's yeah, awesome. so I'll be interviewing her next Thursday. And cool. We'll probably post the following week after that. Okay. Uh, awesome. forward to get, getting to know her, who's not only the distiller, um, she's uh, a level three uh, whiskey sommelier, and she's really sort of standing out. She's, sort of, I think, a rising star uh, in the industry, someone mm -hmm. who has a really good nose and palate. She yes, was just she doing some stuff over with Balconas over there, and they were impressed. So uh, I'm really looking forward to get to know her, her background, her journey, and how she. Yeah, uh, she's super uh, smart. And super awesome. awesome. So um, those who uh, did the super chats, I want to thank you very, very much. I greatly appreciate it. They were uh, hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done uh, it. Tune in. You were doing the most. Like, what the hell happened, to Eric's having like <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if uh, dancing and and whiskey go uh, hand in hand very, very, very well. But uh, hey, um, I'm gonna so we're gonna we're gonna uh, log off because we're right at the hour point, and we're gonna go over to I Whiskey and She Wines and uh, say hello to Bobby and Sam. Absolutely. All right. Cheers and uh, have a good night. Thanks for tuning Cheers. in, Matt. Thanks for having me on. Cheers.